Dunham. Hi, and welcome to Genius Tea Time with Joan Stevens. Thank you so much for being part of this. Um, Joan Stevens has given me her bio, a little short one. So Joan Stevens, aka Mama Botanica, has a, an MS in botany with an emphasis on plant chemistry and ethnobotany. As part of her explorations, she has ingested a variety of awareness-expanding plant compounds. All good. She's a professor at PCC, Pasadena City College, a backyard flower farmer, and a permaculture instructor. Uh, studying botany opened her eyes to a whole new way of looking at the world, and permaculture provided practical skills to apply that new understanding. And flower farming has shown her how local businesses help build community. She believes wholeheartedly that partnering with the plants helps make this world a better place and brings a future we can look forward to. And there's a future I want, so that's awesome. We're going to tell us about Amigas de los Rios, the organization we're sponsoring today. Okay, so it is a local organization. You can picture their little office right now. I buy it regularly. And I first worked with them um, because they have been putting in uh, greening school gardens, um, greening school properties actually in Pasadena and I think other places too, but they've also had projects working on something called the Emerald Necklace where they're trying to have parks that connect all kinds of areas in our local watershed and really revitalize the watershed and, and rebuild its capacity to retain water, absorb water and, and hold on to it. Um, I just love the work that they do. And I took my uh, environmental horticulture class to one of their school sites as a field trip this last spring. And it was such an extraordinary place for the kids to play. When I think about the contrast between, uh, you know, black asphalt that just bakes in the heat and, you know, with like lines drawn on it in paint, like here's your playground kids versus like this playground that they built that had topography and there were like giant, like a giant stump that was like the size of a car. I don't even know where they got this thing um, and just all kinds of places for the kids to like like climb around in and jump off of and I mean it was just such an extraordinary place for the kids but also like you know butterflies and hummingbirds and you know lots of native plants and it was just it's like where I wish my kids were you know I wish all kids had that so I just I, I want to support them in every way I can. That's amazing oh, that sounds great and what would you like to tell us today about the plants saving the world? Great. So first, I'm going to give a little bit of a background um, in who I am and how I came into this work and this mindset, and then a little bit of setting the stage in terms of like what's happening in the world right now, and probably none of that's going to be a big surprise. Um, and then some of the things that have really inspired me lately, like ways that, um, you know, when we think about the state of the world, often it's easy to, to get pessimistic. You know, it's, it's easy to get overwhelmed and feel like, what, what are we going to do? Um, especially, you know, because I teach environmental science at PCC and it's, it's real easy to tell a story that's so doom and gloom and tragic, right? But this is not, not the whole picture. Um, and it doesn't necessarily serve a purpose to inspire one to action. And there's so many really incredible things happening in the world right now. And these are, I'm going to share some of the things that I think are most inspiring and then talk about um, this vision that I have, um, it's what I call it thrivelihoods, um, to really encourage people to be in action in ways that make a difference. So about me, um, gosh, it seems like I've been working with plants and working in and around plants for quite a while, but I did not start out that way. You know, I just like my, my grew up, my parents grew up on farms. Um, but, you know, I think we had a garden when I was growing up, but it wasn't like a part of, of anything that I really remember at all. <clears throat> it was just sort of a hap haphazard thing. It, it wasn't that plants were a really important part of my life. And then something changed, which I hope will happen to my kids too, or like, oh, I hate flowers, um, my boys, you know. Um, that they'll they'll have an epiphany of like oh yes this uh, this is sort of just the, the the water that I was growing up in you know and now I I see it for what it was, um, and you know part of it happened because I I thought drugs were super super interesting when I was in uh, college, um, not so much in high school but certainly in college and like you know anthropology like cool ways of like healing and magic witchcraft and the occult like I was really into into these kinds of things. 
Um, I went to Occidental College, which I, I point that way because it's literally like, you know, I don't know, five miles, maybe 10 miles that way. Um, so I was very interested in anthropology. Um, you know, culture to me was just fascinating, still is. And at some point though, I, I got hooked into the idea of plants and how they were used. And I think, you know, I'm trying to recall even, uh, you know, I was very interested in, in medicinal plants and, and healing rituals associated with plants. And, and also curious too about, you know, reading about these things. I was saying earlier that I had um, a book that influenced me that I used in a lot of papers is called uh, Hallucinogens and Cross-Cultural Perspective. And it's by Marlene Dobkin de Rios. And she had married the son of a shaman. I think he was Peruvian um, and had written this book. You know, it's a very good anthropological text. It's kind of dry and sort of distance and sort of like observing about these phenomena kind of from an outsider's perspective, which is like a good anthropology book. And, and so I had a, a wonderful, um, you know, just a couple of different meetings with someone who was doing um, academic work, I think it was in the, the College of, of um, it was medical anthropology, actually, the University of Minnesota, because I was back in Minnesota, where I'd grown up. And he said, well, you should maybe write letters or see if you can go study with um, the people that you, uh, you know, were influenced by. I go, okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. It wouldn't have occurred to me before, you know, that these are like people that have written books and, you know, who am I? Um, and I've actually used that so many times in my life and it's been such a great source of information and connection. Um, so I sent a letter, you know, I would really like to study with you. I'm very interested in what you're doing. And she said, you know, great, you know, apply, which I did. And I got into uh, Cal State Fullerton and I moved my whole life from, you know, cool hippie culture, like working at a, a co-op restaurant, you know, where everybody, even the people that had been there for 20 years made $4.50 an hour. Um, a collective. Um, it's been around since the 60s and still exists um, to Orange County. And that was like such a different sort of place, such a different sort of place. Um, and Dr. De Rios, she was not at all what I had imagined her to be. You know, she wasn't really interested in hallucinogens and cross-cultural perspectives. She just felt like she had this sort of, you know, hook with her, her uh, father-in-law and then, you know, wanted to author a book. She was much more interested in uh, cross-cultural pain tolerance and all kinds of other things. But she had some excellent advice as well. She said, if you want to study anthropology, you should have some other skill set, which is very, very practical. If you want to study ethnobotany in the way that plants are used in healing rituals, you should learn some botany. And as someone who'd gone through college avoiding working hard, um, you know, I was like, I'm not going to take a science class, like, no way. I really, I just, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I spent most of my time like partying. That's pretty much what I did all through my, my first four years of college at Occidental College right over there. Um, <clears throat> so I finally decided like, I, I, I ought to do this. I ought to take a little bit of botany. And I had the great fortune of connecting with uh, Dr. Jack Burke, who's the author of Plant Ecology of California, one of, one of those books. And he had had someone just like a few years prior to me who'd sort of been a, a, a crossover from the English department. And she'd worked really well for him and everybody loved her in the department. And then she and her husband, I think had gone on to run a huge like wildlife um, area in Orange County. Um, so he was willing to take a chance on me, even though I was from psychology and anthropology, I was not a scientist at all, uh, a natural scientist. And so he took me under his wing and let me like grade a, a undergraduate biology class that I'd never taken, you know, so I had a little bit of income and then, you know, we took classes like field botany and all kinds of other classes. And, and I just, I was in heaven. I mean, I was in heaven so much so that he used to joke that I was the only tenured uh, graduate student which is kind of funny and kind of sad both at the same time. Um, and I spent a lot of you know, living on my student loans, um, took out lots of student loans to get that master's degree, which took me a long time because I got a full undergraduate degree in biology as well as um, a, a minor in chemistry at the same time. Um, but you know, it was really, it was an extraordinary time because I, I, I didn't really have, nobody was depending on me. I had a dog, you know, that was it. I could just dive into chemistry and 
I just, I just found that I, I blossomed and I loved it and I loved the rigor of it. And I loved the new way of thinking about the world and field botany particularly was, was just extraordinary because before, you know, I had looked at a patch of green stuff on the ground and been like, that's grass. Right. And then never given it a second thought. And suddenly like in a square foot of grass, there's like grass, there's maybe some clover in there. There might be like three or four different kinds of grass, you know, and then like maybe three or four different kinds of, of annual weeds, you know, weeds, however we use that term. But there was like a whole bunch of stuff going on that before was under my radar. I had never noticed it before. And now, even if I didn't know the name of the plant, I learned to see them. I learned to recognize the differences between them. Um, you know, to, to identify, well, this is not like the other, you know, even with grass, like I didn't even know that grass had flowers before that. Now I, I it, you know, it's, it's hard to believe it, it's like before the plants and then after the plants, you know, things that I, I just never would have been aware of, you know, like even the term flower, like so many people in the world think that a flower is like a thing, right? The, the, this plant is a flower. No, 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 flower is like just part of the life cycle. You know, it's part of the flowering plants, like the flowering plants all have flowers. Um, it's just, you know, the stage in the life cycle. It's like the, the, the juicy sort of like maiden who's trying to, you know, get some action, right? Before she has the, the seeds, which are the offspring. And um, so, yeah, just understanding the way that plants work. It, it was like, it was like getting plugged into reality. And it's so easy to grow up in this culture without that grounding, without that plug you know, without that connection to like the seasons and understanding that a flower is part of the life cycle of a plant rather than like this plant is a flower, you know? Um, so at the same time that I was doing that, that I was getting all this academic kind of stuff, uh, I also was um, interested in, in, you know, hallucinogens and cross-cultural perspective. I was interested in ayahuasca and a lot of these alternative healing experiences and, and, and Richard Evan Schultes, can't believe I didn't even put him in my outline. I forgot about him for a moment, but dearly departed Richard Evan Schultes, who is just an extraordinary botanist um, out of Harvard. He did groundbreaking work with, with people all over South America and was um, you know, often in, in ethnobotanical disciplines, there can be is sort of like the carryover of anthropo anthropology, which is, you know, let, let me just sit and look at you here, you know, give me a seat at your table so I can write down everything you do and then try to make up reasons for why you did that thing, which is just such an invasive and kind of gross way to be with people. And I didn't ever get to meet Richard Evan Schultes, but according to many people, um, he didn't have that disease that othering disease. He was very brilliant academic, but he was also, you know, saw people for people and, and built relationships with, with people as well. Um, it's part of why I think he was also such an extraordinary ethnobotanist too. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you ever look into his work, there, there's some phenomenal uh, website that goes over his entire career and some of it, well, not the entire career, but a lot of it. And a lot of the places that he went to that like that I think had not seen any foreigners before and maybe even since really. I mean, he, he did some extraordinary exploring um, and also, you know, named all kinds of plants and described all kinds of rituals with plants. So he was someone early on that I, I just admired. Uh, I thought he was just such a, such a cool person and I really always wanted to meet him, but I think he had Parkinson's or something, the time that I maybe would have. And so he was already a bit out of commission, but I, I, I sing his praises wherever I can. So I'm exploring this stuff in the world of ethnobotany and I'm in Orange County where there's not a whole lot of like, like hippie mind expanding, you know, it's really, that's not the world there, right? It's what was the John Bircher Society or something like that. These are like pretty conservative folks, you know? But even, you know, the, even like working in the Arboretum, uh, which I did often, you know, there were people who probably, our politics were so different, but we loved plants and we could talk forever about the plants, you know? Um, and I, I got, had a real fondness too for the, the older people, the older people and their plant wisdom. 
Um, in my own family tradition, I didn't get a lot of that plant wisdom, you know, like the farms were mostly done by the time I showed up. And mostly it wasn't a great story. It was a story of like hard work and failure. Um, it wasn't a story of like connection and community, which is what I romanticize it as. Um, you know, but even like at the Fullerton Arboretum, just chatting with a plant that we really liked, you know, I could have great conversations with people and learn so much because these are people that have been gardening for 30 and 40 years or more, you know, what an amazing wealth of knowledge. So during that same time, you know, I went to the, uh, um, uh, and it wasn't even anthropology of consciousness, but there was a, a conference in Killarney, Ireland, and there were some radical thinkers like Rupert Sheldrake and Christian Reich and a whole bunch of other interesting people um, that they're, they're also kind of involved in, in ethnobotany and, and have written articles about you know, wild plant use and, and, and psychoactive adventures. Um, so I was doing these conferences at the same time. And then I, I was curious about ayahuasca and I bumped into a friend at a Mayan calendar workshop, made a new friend at a Mayan calendar workshop who said, oh, did you happen to know? that there's a Santo Daime, which is an ayahuasca church out of Brazil. Um, but there's a Santo Daime church, you know, we're, 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 we're doing this here in Los Angeles, you know, my ears perk. I'm like, oh, really? Um, so I ended up participating in that. Um, and it became something that I did pretty regularly for quite a while. Um, in, in that tradition, once you take your star, which is a little like six pointed star you wear with your little Catholic schoolgirl uniform with like a blue pleated skirt and a little white button up shirt. Um, when you do that, which is something that I have done, um, then it's a lifetime kind of commitment. But I am not a very good committed lifetimer. Um, it's been a long time since I've been back to the Santo Daime. Um, but you know, it's, 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 the experience of ingesting ayahuasca in my belief system shifts back through your lineage. I mean, and this is not science I'm talking about. This is something that I feel and believe is that it, it affects the way that my lineage moves through me and how I uh, refer to them and connect to them. You know, and maybe that would have happened without the ayahuasca, but it really felt like the ayahuasca does something, you know, that, that you know, there are stories in anthropology of, of uh, people who have no knowledge of deoxyribonucleic acid, our DNA, right? The, the hereditary material that like you get from the egg and the sperm and blah, 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 from your grandparents and there, da, 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 right? All that stuff. And it's, um, you know, to the double helix, right? It's like a shape like this, right? Um, these, these twining ladders. And there are, there are, there are accounts in, in the anthropological lit literature of, of shaman describing these spiraling ladders that go to the ancestors. I mean, if that's not some little spark of, of I don't know, evolutionary wisdom insight, I don't know what. I mean, that to me is like, I totally get that. I, I believe that. That makes sense to me. And in my own heart, my, my own heart, mind, like I, I feel like it changed the way that I relate to my ancestors. <laughs> and I feel like it made me better able to, I don't know, like to, to let them move me. It's a little weird sort of channeling thing, not at all what I meant to talk about right now, but it's appropriate to bring up the ancestors. So I also happened to go to this conference that they used to do. Um, and I only yesterday, I was looking this up to try to remember the name of it. And it turns out that Ken Symington, who is someone, I think he's still running Nature Friends in Sierra Madre, um, which is a great place to know of, both for places to ha have people gather, but also for the gatherings that they've had there, um, the Botanical Preservation Corps. And this was something that was um, Jonathan Ott, his book, Ruminations of, a Kaka of an Unabashed Cacahuatl Addict, I mean, Jonathan Ott is just a phenomenal author. He's extraordinary. Lots of big words, but playful and funny and rich. Um, so he was one of the founders and uh, Terrence McKenna, and I'm not sure who else, um, but you know, back when, when Terrence McKenna and his wife, uh, Kat, were married, and they, they, they also had a, you know, Kat, I think, then had the company Botanical Preservation Corps. 
and they were trying to uh, take, especially like cacti that were rare and going endangered because of habitat loss and all kinds of other things and, and hold on to them. Are you gonna ask a question? No, okay, just that was, it looked like a question was coming. Um, so they had a, they used to have these, I think annual conferences and this one was in Palenque in, in Mexico, right, right near the, the, the ruins of Palenque in this beautiful resort, you know, and I was just some poor grad student at the time, you know, I like just scrapped together student loans to, to make this happen. And, uh, and one of the people was there, his name was, poof, I remembered it last night and now it just went boom. Anyway, and I could see his face, he had red hair. He apparently was one of the people that supplied Terrence with all his magical chemistry. And, um, and the Alex Shulgin, Alex and Sasha Shulgin were there. Um, the Shulgins who've also wrote, they wrote Teo, Teotihuacan, uh, Tikal, sorry, no, no, Tikal, um, te, Oh, it's some it's, it's a T that's psychoactive compounds I have known and loved. I and mean, then this is also, it's a, it's a chemistry book. Like the last half of the book is a cookbook for making all these mind expanding chemicals and recreational, however you wanna describe them. And the first half is like the love story. I think that the, the second, the subtitle is a chemical love story. And, um, and it's just this beautiful story about how they came together and they're, they're wonderful people. Um, I think they have both passed at this point. Um, they were madly in love and they would have these, um, these parties where he would manufacture these chemicals and then they would try them out and they would all rate them. It was very like scientific in a really lovely way. Um, they would, they, oh, phenethyl almines is the other. Um, phenethyl al al almines, that's not right. Phenethyl, whatever. But there's PCOL and TCOL are his two books. Um, and then they would, they would, you know, the people at the party would like rate the compound, like, you know, any kind of body sensations, like what does it, how does it make you feel, uh, you know, and, and the stories of these adventures are just fantastic. So the, the books detail those stories of the first half and the second half is like the chemical recipe book, which is just great stuff. So these guys were also there. Um, I mean, it was just like a brain trust of, of the wacky far out science, nerdy plant psychoactive people. Um, so. My gosh, this name, it'll come to me at some point, probably like I'll be, you know, serving my kids dinner. I'll be like that. It was Frank. It may actually have been Frank. So Frank is like, would you like to smoke a little DMT? You know, and I, you know, I was like in my 25, maybe early 30s, I was pretty much a yes to everything. I was a yes and then figure it out, you know, yes. And then if I'm in danger, like make another plan. Um, I don't necessarily advise that, you know, these days. I um, certainly would not tell like my, my kids that if they were girls, but it worked out okay for me. So, you know, and everyone was like, you know, smoking off this, like a crack pipe. Like it was not really my thing, but I was willing, right? So, and they were falling back on the bed and then they'd come back and talk about these machine elves or this or that or the other. Like, okay, I'm game, I guess you see machine elves, right? And someone said, oh, you should go outside. And so we went outside and we were in Palenque in the rainforest. And I had spent like the whole week just being like my own little, like, I'm just a little nerdy plant girl, you know, like tickling the little mimosas that then the leaves all fold in and like, oh, look, it's a quercus, which is an oak. We have these back home, you know, just like nerding out with all the plants and, and always on the outskirts. You know, I'm, I'm never the trailblazer. I'm not the one that says I have arrived. You know, I'm the one that like hangs back and goes, some of these people look friendly, you know. So anyway, so here I am with Frank, right? And I, I take the hit off the DMT pipe and I'm expecting that I'm gonna like sink back, you know? And instead I grab him by the hand and I am propelled forward. And I am telling him what is really here. This is a temple. I see the architecture of the brain. I can feel the goosebumps actually, because it's so alive for me still. I can see above me the ways that the branches come together and it's a cathedral. I mean, this is, you know, my, my own religious iconography, right? That it's, it's a temple and it is rainforest and the faces, the faces of all the people that have been here on this very land that have touched these plants that have been here that are still part of this land. It's all right there. I take my clothes off right? And I'm pulling this guy, Frank, along who's like, you know, yippee, right? And I'm telling him what's here. And, and I, you know, I want to get on my belly 
want to get on my belly here in this, this, this beautiful living landscape. I am breathing with this landscape. And then the fireflies start going and then it starts to rain. And, and I really truly believe that that rain was like the cat, like it was me and my consciousness, boom, like connecting. I mean, I mean, this is a long time ago that this happened and I'm really like goosebumped recalling it like so vividly again, because it was such an extraordinary thing. And I feel like it was my earlier work too with the ayahuasca that kind of like set the stage and also my seeing the plants, you know, like I don't have a tradition that I'm aware of of, of psychoactive plants, of, of this real uh, revelatory connection, that kind of reciprocal connection to the plants, you know, that I always sort of wish that I had, right? That, you know, people maybe with brown skin sometimes get in, a lot of us who don't have that, we don't, we don't have that connection necessarily. Um, but, but here it was, you know, and, and, and it, was, it was just right there. Um, but I felt like a lot of it was, was just my wonder and amazement and utter delight in, in the botany side of things, in understanding the taxonomy of things. And, oh, this is a quercus. That means it's related somewhere back in time. There's a common ancestor with, you know, the, the quercus that's in my backyard, you know, and just like, just being so delighted by this um, that I, I felt like, like, it was sort of a gift, you know, that, that was the reciprocity was like, you see us, we're going to show, we're going to show you really how it is, you know, anyway. Um, so that was a really lovely conference. It was wonderful and fun. And then when I got back, I started exploring a little bit of permaculture too, because at the time, you know, I, a lot of people have gone into studying psychoactive plant use and whatever, but there just wasn't really a, a way for me to do that in a very cohesive way. That I felt at the time. Um, and, you know, I, and I was always looking for ways to kind of apply what I've learned and, and experience a little bit, you know, more of the world. So I started learning about permaculture. I was working for the Forest Service actually up in Big Bear. And I met a family of people that, that their dad was Australian. And, and so they knew a lot about permaculture. And I think that was the first time I'd heard that word because um, it was, came out of Australia. And I looked into places where I could maybe learn more about permaculture. And I connected with Larry Santoyo, who at the time was in San Luis Obispo. And I was going up there taking a permaculture design course. So I signed up to take the 72 hour permaculture design course. And I drive up there like, I don't know, one weekend a month, or maybe it was like every weekend in a row. <laughs> and permaculture was also like, boom. You know, it connected all these different things that I was into, like yoga and how we think about our body and our space and, and design and, you know, food and medicine and materials that we use and like just practical design. Like it was just, it was, it was an epiphany. And I still think it's really among the most exciting disciplines out there, particularly if we want to talk about, you know, saving the world. I mean, the world is fine. It's really the humans and our culture that's, that's a, a threat. So, you know, permit, permaculture comes from the words permanent culture. It used to really describe permanent agriculture, but it's much more broad than that. Um, it's really using nature as the model to design to meet human needs. Um, and so many things that we do in our culture are, are the antithesis of this. We don't use nature as the model. We use nature as a resource. It's just a, a limitless resource. And it's been that way for generations, for hundreds of years. I mean, thousands of years, you know, nature is a resource. We keep cutting the trees. Sure, they'll keep growing back, right? You know, it's like the Lorax, right? I mean, my kids, one of my kids was just watching this, you know, the, the, the what was it, the, the um, truffula trees. You know, there's so many truffula trees. We'll just keep making thneeds. A thneed is the thing that everyone needs. You know, and if you've ever seen the story of stuff, um, Annie, whose name I can't remember, last name, but the woman who narrates that, it is just, it's like, sh everybody ought to watch this. And it's been around for 15 years or something, but it's just such a perfect little synopsis of what's messed up with our consumer culture. You know, most of the goods that we buy are in, in the landfill in six months on average. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's gut-wrenching how much trash, how much throughput we have. We take beautiful raw materials, turn them into something, cover them with plastic, ship them out, 
use them up, throw them away as fast as we can. Like that model has never, ever, ever existed before that we've had the whole globe of resources um, and that we can just throw stuff away at such an incredible rate and, and when such a huge amount of energy investment into that whole system, it's, it's bizarre. So I see my little outline here and I wanna get back to it. Um, so that's, you know, permaculture really spoke to me because I'd already been studying anthropo anthropology, right? Culture. And I also had been teaching um, AP environmental science at the high school for a long time. Um, and it just seemed like something's not working with the system and we need a new way of thinking and being and permaculture felt like that. So um, more recently, you know, as I have like two young kids and, and I'm not a young person, by the way, I had my kids old. I mean, that's relative, right? Um, 43 and 46 when I had my kids, which is, you know, older than all the other moms at the park. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it meant a lot of changes in my life. Like I was not the number one anymore. I couldn't just go like go to Palenque for the week for fun. Um, you know, I got to get up early in the morning and, and feed my kids and all that kind of stuff. And I found I was like, you know, I planted a big garden. We'd moved to a new house and I put in some garden beds in the back. But, you know, having two young kids and trying to garden, especially with food. And I perennial things and trees that we can eat from and all that kind of stuff. But it was, uh, it was a real slog to get anything edible, you know, like, especially with a new garden, you know, the pests are like, yippee, you know, it's a, it's a bonanza. So it'd be like, oh, here's the kale we can eat. We'll just rinse it like five times. You know, I mean, it was just covered in aphids. Like I didn't want to eat that. And I consider myself kind of a, you know, I used to consider myself more of that, but you know, like I let them tough, I'm going to eat what's the food is, but it was so unappetizing. Um, and it was kind of demoralizing, you know, I, I want this, this verdant garden. Um, and then, you know, we just had a, like a, a triple whammy of like both kids sick, husbands out of town on some like psychoactive week. Yeah. Moms, you know, we got pneumonia. My six month old had pneumonia. My other kid had an ear infection. It was like no sleep and just awful. It was just awful. Right. And my husband comes back to town and I, and I said, you're going to pay for me to take a flower farming course. Like, um, okay, because before I'm like, oh, I, this looks cool, but I would never spend that money. And I'm like, you know, I think I need to do this. Otherwise, I'm going to leave my family. Um, I mean, I joke about that, but it was like, it was extreme. Like I needed something and that was mine. Um, and so I signed up for this flower farming course that Erin um, Benzikine from, she does Floret, Floret Flower Farms up in, in the Bay Area. And you can tell right away that her first career was marketing because she's marketing the flower farming lifestyle beautifully. I mean, she's impeccable. But I read this stuff and I'm like, you know, I'm a botanist. I'm a master gardener. I can do this. Um, and they tried it out. And I started growing lots of flowers. And it was just like a balm to my soul. You know, like there was a lot of sort of like masculine energy in my house, you know, like the, the man and the two boys and the fighting and the, the nerf everywhere and the, and the noise. And I come outside and it's beautiful color, you know, the flowers and their color and the butterflies and all the, the, the life from the flowers, you know, inviting that life in and then even just cutting them and arranging them. And it's just been, it's been a really wonderful thing. Um, and I also mentioned too, that, you know, I really want to help people grow stuff. And there's a lot of people out there teaching people how to grow food, you know, and I grew food for a long time. Um, and, you know, but, but like flowers to me, there's something about them that, that gets right into like the tender places. You know, there, there was a, a man, Ab Abu Wad, I think was his name. And he was the gardener of Aleppo. And he was growing flowers when there were bombs falling all around his city. You know, and for a long time, especially coming from a permaculture background, I thought flowers were a stupid waste of time. Why would you grow those if you could grow food? I mean, isn't that the most important thing everyone could be doing is growing food? Right? I was so certain that this was the case. But I've not had food stop me in my tracks. I've not had food, like, you know, like the, the flowers will truly, like, uh, you know, I just pause and the, the world just melts away. It's gone. It's just 
ah, oh, this moment of beauty, like that breathy pause that just puts you right into your body and brings you right to the moment. So that to me is, is part of the beauty of what, what flowers have. <laughs> and I'm also a huge supporter. Yes, beauty feeds our soul. Absolutely, it's so essential these days as well. Um, my computer is doing something. I don't know that you can see that. I hope you can't. No, no, no. Hold on. I'm gonna ignore what that is, what my computer is saying right there. <laughs> okay. Just yeah, see, it just bleeped out there. for a moment. That's all. Oh. Use the login keychain, like, yeah, whatever. It's just going to be in the middle of my head, but you can't see it, so that's fine. So um, from that place, then, they started a, a plant sciences program at Pasadena City College, where I teach, and so I've been teaching environmental horticulture. Um, but also, you know, like, I've, I've been, like, horticulture and uh, landscaping, basically, but it's kind of like a, a permaculture design course, and also it's a little bit about, like, how can we reconnect to things that are real? How can we reconnect to things that are real? You know, how can we build in a sense of reciprocity between us and the plant kingdom? How can we start to see the plants that are already around us? And it's super empowering to be able to give them names. You know, and there's so many apps these days that can help with that. Although those are super tricky because like I have a pretty decent background in, in, in botany and in naming plants. And, you know, I had never really noticed shrubs before. They're just like shrubs, you know, like whatever. Uh, you know, I wasn't a landscaper, so I didn't really see them. And now there's like, you know, 20 shrubs on the plant list I'm supposed to be teaching my students. And so I'm using these plant apps to try to identify these different shrubs. And sometimes it comes back with, this is a tracheophyte, which is like all the things that aren't moss. Like, you know, I mean, if you are not, like, it's not, I mean, it's just like AI with anything, right? can be helpful in the right context, not always so helpful. Um, so if you really wanna know some plants, they'll like spend time at, at nurseries. <laughs> They've got tags, hooray. Um, or like, if you wanna know the names of native plants, you know, both like the native plant nurseries, like the Theodore Payne Foundation and other native plant nurseries, but also the California Native Plant Society, they have field trips all the time. And they're doing some pretty heavy, like using the Jepson keys and try to figure out plants that, you know, that normal people would never even tell the difference between. Um, but in the meantime, you know, they're on a field trip and they'll, you'll just learn lots and lots of plant names, which I think is pretty cool. So um, I had, a, I wanted to mention, you know, the fact that like things are not great in the world, but I don't think I need to mention that at all. <laughs> My point even for bringing that up was the fact that it's time, you know, it's time to start building these reciprocal relationships. It's time to start seeing that nature is around us, even if we're in the middle of the city. You know, uh, Farmer Rishi, he, he's a kind of controversial guy. Um, he's out in Claremont doing wonderful food foresting, growing extraordinary varieties of plants, like blackberries that are like that big. I mean, he's really doing great work. Like if you want to get the best of, of, the, of the edibles, you know, tap into his, his supply of stuff. But, you know, he stresses this all the time. And at first I was a little put off by it, but I get it now. It's like, you know, we're not, nature is not away. Nature is not in some pristine place. You know, nature is in my backyard in Pasadena, right? Now I'm all for like taking the fences down and wildlife corridors and, you know, really like making it a better place for nature. Like E.O. Wilson talks about, I think 10% for the planet. Like we should save 10% of the planet that's just for the wildlife. I think that's extraordinary. Um, I think it's, a, it's kind of an essential thing. I, I truly believe that. Neil Wilson, if anybody would know, you know, another departed ancestor um, who was an extraordinary author, talked about biophilia, that, that we have an inherent love of life and nature that is just part of our, our evolutionary heritage. And I believe him, especially because he grew up loving ants. Um, he was a myrmecologist for a long time. And even as a little boy growing up in Alabama, like he was super into ants. Sadly, you can't really do that here in Southern California because now we only have Argentine ants, which is sad. Because ants are an easy way to get people into like, they're all around. But the Argentine ants are maybe not as exciting as like, you know, five different kinds of ants you can go find. Um, but 10% 10 10 for the planet, I think is, is, a, is a really great idea, but that's at scale, right? What can you do to do like 
for the planet, even if you have a patio balcony on an apartment, you know, can you do 10% for the planet there, right? Can, you know, if, if you've got just a little patch of ground, can you do 10% for the planet there, right? <laughs> so if you've got just a little patch of grass, maybe on one little bit of it, yeah, you can grow milkweed, you know, like, like take, take 10% or more, you know, don't stop at 10, but it's good to start. This is another great permaculture thing is start small and then scale up. Because another thing that we have a tendency to do is like super excited about stuff. I'm going to transform the whole backyard, you know, and then it's like, oh, that's a lot of work. And you got a little bit done and then you're over it, right? Um, you know, start at scale and then build on your success, 10%, cool. Um, so there's a huge amount of biodiversity in my backyard. You know, I don't I say I don't spray, like I occasionally, like maybe I'll spray like a horticultural oil if I'm being super on top of things in the winter time and I wanna grow nice roses, but usually I just don't get around to it, which is not an ethics thing, it's just about time. Um, but for the most part, you know, I don't, I don't use pesticides, I just don't. Usually I use my fingers, you know, I take the aphids off with my fingers. Um, and if a pest problem comes up, because I have enough diversity now, especially with so many flowers, which is another advantage of flower farming rather than vegetable farming. Vegetables, there's not a huge number of different plant families. You've got like your brassicas, right? You like your broccoli and kale and kohlrabi and collards. You've got, you know, maybe the, the beets, slightly different family than that. Um, uh, the APACE, which is like carrots um, and dill, and fennel. And then the solanaceae, you know, your eggplants, peppers, um, uh, tomatoes, tobacco, you know, we grow that for, for flowers anyway. Um, it's just not a huge amount of diversity. So if you get something that comes in like the cabbage looper, like that little green thing that wants to eat all your broccoli and stuff and whatever, it's gonna go to town on all of the brassicas, right? Um, but with the flowers, there's such a huge amount of diversity, the way that I grow anyway, um, in a small space that it's, you know, the pests, th there's not like a whole big smorgasbord, you know, it's not like a, a monocrop kind of thing where there's, you know, enough similarity that they can really kind of jump from one to the next. So there's a far reduced amount of pest damage. It's kind of nice, but also um, it just makes for a lot more biodiversity because if you have a little population of pests, then they're predators are called in, right? So then you get like the pests and you get some predators and like, there is so much going on in my backyard. You know, it's just like, there are so many bugs flying around and crawling around and like big ones and little ones. And like, I've created a real, you know, like a, a bug heaven, really. There's lots of diversity, lots of interactions. Um, you know, that's like a yield that I have from growing a lot of diverse flowers. Um, that I might not otherwise have. And to me, it's just like, you know, if you're hanging out in the backyard and the, the uh, Gulf fritillary butterflies, which nest on the passion vine, um, Judith, if you don't have them already, you probably will. They've got the, the caterpillars are like orange and kind of steel gray looking. They're really cool. Um, and then the butterflies look like small monarchs kind of, or the, uh, okay. the um, what is the, with the yellow, the sw yellow swallowtail butterflies? Oh yeah. You know, there are so many butterflies in my backyard. It's wild. You know, oh, give me that. Crazy. I'm watching like monarchs out here. Cause I, I did put in milkweed. Okay. Yay. And, and I'm trying to make <laughs> yeah. sure the dog doesn't wreck it. So, yeah. just, you know, having, having these kind of experiences where you, you know, like play God, I guess, sort of goddess really, you know, where you are like creating these, these opportunities for life to yeah. do its thing, you know, like this, this is where life is rich and good. Now, there are specific things that I also wanted to mention, because cool. you could tell, like, I could talk about this for a long time, so you yeah. didn't realize that, um, but in terms of, like, specific things that, that we can do, like that resilient future kind of action steps, um, there's some stuff that, that I talk about in my environmental science class that I think are, and also actually all my classes, because I think, like, people need to know this, right? Like for many of us, when we learned about the water cycle, we learned about, you know, like the water evaporates off the, off the oceans and then it falls back down as rain or, you know, falls runoff, da, 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 da. But what they didn't include was the biotic pump. And there's a really great little video. It's like three minutes long that explains this beautifully. Um, and I think the title is the biotic pump and I think it's on YouTube. And it, it, you can also look it up as forests make the rain. So something that they're, they're real understanding now 
is the role that biology plays in the water cycle. You know, and, and botanists have known this for a long time that plants transpire. You know, they take water from their roots and they move it up their tall bodies and then they let it out through their leaves. That's just transpiration. You know, that's why if you have an area that has plants, it's gonna be a little bit more humid than an area that doesn't. Um, but the role that that plays in creating rain in places that haven't had rain before is really quite substantial. So this biotic pump that brings rain to places. And in that short YouTube video too, what, what the person, the narrator says is like, this is something that indigenous people have talked about forever. Um, and it's just such an important thing, you know, so we've got the biotic pump. If you can get some plants to grow, you can build in more plants, right? Because once you get a few established, um, then you can, you know, you, you end up with some plant, plant material falling down and a little bit more organic matter building the soil, right? The, the, the roots are going to hold onto that soil. So if any rain falls, they grab it and then they transpire it. So when you get, build that up and build that up and build that up, then you can have you know, water and rain where there hasn't been for a long time. So the role of plants in creating the rain is really important. And so why deforestation is such a tragic and, and, and wrong thing to do. So reforesting is a good thing to do. And as, uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna jump a little bit, as uh, there are a couple different really inspiring places where I've seen this, not with my own eyes, but on videos, um, mm -hmm. One is the, the Lowe's Plateau, L-O-E-S-S, -S, in China, I think in Northwest China, which is very dry desert. Um, so Dennis Liu, who's a filmmaker, he has um, filmed some of this restoration. And it's restoration that's happened, I think, maybe in the decade. It's like not in, you know, to generations of time. It's like decades of time, where mm -hmm. they took what was uh, just completely desolate, dry, parched desert and turned it into a verdant grassland. Um, and he's got lots of great videos about this, like short little three minutes that, that show this, this transformation. Um, and we get to listen to him at a, a drylands permaculture course too. And he, you know, he talks about this and many other projects like this where doing targeted restoration can, can transform an ecology from a dry desert, like, and these are deserts that are degraded. They're not, you know, deserts that have historically been desert. These are deserts that were denuded of, of trees and then became desertified. Um, and then flipping that switch and revegetating them. Like there are so many extraordinary examples of this. So we've got the biotic pump. We've got this. We've also got Jeff Lawton, G-E-O-F-F, -F, um, L-A-T-W-O-N, Jeff Lawton. He's done a lot of uh, videos about greening the desert and his projects are in Jordan. And I think maybe they take a little bit of irrigation water to get them started. But once you, once you prime that pump for life, you know, it, it's depending, I think you need like a critical mass, <coughs> but once you have the parts in place, it's, it's not such a stretch that a place even in Jordan, which is extraordinarily dry, can be growing food and fiber and all kinds of stuff for the people that live there. And a lot of this work is actually done even looking both at you know, indigenous people now in dry places, as well as looking even at the archeological record. Um, there's a, a great book called Secrets of the Desert, and then the Namib Desert, and that, that back in the day, people used to stack stones as places for condensation to start to cool. And they would have, they would plant like an olive tree and then with the stones stacked around it to bring the water to the roots. You know, stuff like that, like, like simple, brilliant technology that you know we we could we could be doing stuff like this with the precious water that we have now and the incredible resource of fossil fuels like i know that we're we're denigrating fossil fuels right but i really feel like if we were if we were in reverence to what they are and the capacity that they have for energy we wouldn't be using them so foolishly you know if we were like making altars at the gas station these are the bones and bodies of our ancient ancient ancestors Thank you for giving us this incredible power, you know, and like, let's not just drive to the freaking grocery store that's like three blocks away to get milk, right, with this beautiful resource or, you know, using it to blow up people, whatever, right? If we were more reverent about these resources, <laughs> we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. Um, anyway, and yeah, if we were, you know, using these precious tools we have, like right now we have incredible access to water. I mean, it's diminishing, but still it's unprecedented the amount of, of power, actual energy power, like physics power 
that people like you and I have capacity, you know, they have the access to that never in history did people like you and I have access to this much of the world's resources. We are living like the kings and queens of old, you know, and, and squandering it like it's no big deal. You know, it's, it's, it's just a, a different way of looking at things. Anyway, so back to ecological restoration, right? So we've got the Lowe's Plateau, we've got Jeff Lawton greeting the desert and so many examples like that of taking denuded and deforested to pauperate landscapes and turning them back into verdant places where food can grow. And even if it's not food for us, it still sets up that ecosystem. It becomes food for something else. Um, and then even, you know, the, the, the whole cycle of life jumps from there. Um, other super inspiring things. So Dennis Liu, I mentioned, is the filmmaker for the Lowe's Plateau stuff, but he also started the eco restoration camps. And I know that the, um, the birdhouse, which is a, a really lovely group of people, I think, in Hollywood, um, Hollywood, I believe, underneath the Hollywood sign up Brentwood Canyon, um, they are registered as an eco restoration camp. And then there's some sweet people up in San Jose, um, just really lovely people who are also registered Coyote Eco Camp. Paradise, uh, the place that burned, um, has an eco camp. So his idea with these eco camps is that people go there to learn skills. And some people go there to teach the skills, you would hope there needs to be a good match of both of those things. And, uh, and then you have these skills to do ecological restoration, which the planet needs. Now there's like some pieces missing from that puzzle for me. Um, <coughs> one of them is that I think Dennis Liu lives in a giant fancy house because he's like been a filmmaker for a long time. And, but he says that everyone should just go to these eco camps and all the needs will be taken care of by the community. Like, theoretically, that's a great idea. In practice, you know, like I've been to camps like this enough times where the 80-20 rule is what happens. 80% of the people, mm. you know, whatever, 20% of the people do 80% of the work, you know? Like who are the people in the kitchen and doing the cleaning, right? I like that kind of stuff, you know? Who's bringing the, the food that everyone's gonna cook and all that you know, sort of thing. But, you know, these are all things that need to be figured out at some point anyway. And it's not really that different than regular life. But these um, eco restoration camps are supposed to be like great places to learn some skills. And I think they're skills that we all need. Um, uh, okay, uh, just quickly also want to mention there's a woman named um, Ming Kuo, K-U-O. Uh, and I think she also goes by Francis, but I believe her publishing name is Ming. And she, uh, she came out, she spoke at Occidental College and what she was speaking about was her research that showed that when school campuses have trees around them, that the kids end up doing better in school. I mean, it was like, how could this be, right? Um, radical stuff, right? So also that when, when, the, when the students were outside, even for very minimal amounts of time, you know, something that a lot of teachers feel like is going to take away from their instructional time, that even like, I mean, it was something it was kind of sad. It was like, like five minutes a week or something of being outside, that the time in the classroom was much more efficient, that the students were able to concentrate and focus. So it actually ended up being a really good investment of time. Um, so that, that to me was sort of epiphany also about like, where, how are we going to make these big changes we need to make? We need to get kids, you know, kids at schools. Schools are municipal sites. That means it's there, it's public, right? Public school. You know, and I think about the great work of Mark Lakeman, who's a dear friend of mine and someone who I have trouble not putting on a pedestal. You know, he's like that kind of person. Like, I know you're like my friend and stuff, but like, I, I just, you know, am I worthy of your time? Um, where he says, you know, the public lands, that's for us. The public lands are for us. Go do things with these public lands. Like what they've done in Portland is they, they've done intersection repair where they take over the intersection and they paint it. And they paint it with beautiful, inspiring things that the community has come together to say, we want a sunflower. And then the kids say, but I want a dinosaur that's eating a something. And then they, that goes in there too. And somebody else says, oh, and I, I want to include something, you know, the, the person who was there who was, you know, died five years ago, but was such a, a huge resource for the neighborhood, always made these funnel cakes. So then somebody puts a funnel cake into the design. And then there's this whole thing in the intersection that slows traffic a little bit. And is like all of the neighbors came together to create this because it's public space. And a lot of his message 
is we take over public space because it's public. We are the public. If it's not serving us, it's not serving its purpose. And you know, and he shares too that you know, when the first time they did one of these intersection repair projects, um, that somebody said, "You can't do that. That's public space." And just how funny that was, you know. You people can't be out using that space. It's public space. Like, do you hear what you're saying? Um, so, and I think about, you know, like, just it's not just the kids though that need to be raised up to re, um, revitalize, re lively. I don't know what the word is, but to to like take back space. You know, to, to grow plants that are that are food for us and for animals, you know, to build habitat, like just taking things back from from grass that needs to be mown, you know, from like this whole thing that's so focused on cars. Um, I, I think that there's such great room for that. Um, also, you know, imagine like if kids go to school in a place that's this green ecosystem full of little places where they can run and hide and play and they pick cherry tomatoes and eat them. You know, those are kids who are going to eat tomatoes. Those are kids who are going to want more green space. You know, it seems like it's part of why I picked um, Amigos de los Rios because they're doing some of that work, and I think it's just so essential. Um, and then also, I wanted to mention too that uh, Lauren Bond, who's local here in the Metabolic Studio, that that you know there are people who are taking a lot of these ideas of of revegetating and revitalizing and turning them into extraordinary performance art, you know, like life as art. So what they did first was they took this brown field, which is toxic and turn it into not a cornfield. It was a cornfield, but it couldn't be a cornfield because you can't apparently grow things on brown field. So it was not a cornfield, right? And now they've got this bending the river project and just everything that, that, that Metabolic Studios does under her guide to me is, is important work because it, it speaks to our hearts and our minds. And it also shifts the conversation about land and what's possible. And, and it also incorporates history too. You know, what is the history of this land? Which is also, it's, it's a critical part of permaculture. And I think just an important part of, of honoring all the people that have come before, you know, all the people, not just the ones that make it to the history books, right? So when I was planning this talk too, I, I really wanted to talk about thrivelihoods. And this idea is like, you know, I think mostly like for young people, because I deal with a lot of young people, I deal with them. I have the great fortune to be in the company of a lot of younger people who are like at a very different stage of their lives and careers than I am. And I, I feel like, you know, we're focused in, in something we're supposed to be focusing on at, at PCC is like career readiness and what kind of careers students may not, you know, have, they may be first generation college students. They might not know that there's all these other careers. Like if they think of a career in horticulture, they think gardener and gardeners don't make a lot of money and maybe that's not the kind of career they want, but there's so many things that, you know, I'm supposed to help them understand, which is great. But I think there's also like a whole avenue of entrepreneurial things I call thrivelihoods. Like what if you could do something, and this is also inspired by Mark Lakeman too, because this little quote of his recently blew my mind. He said, what if we're not so concerned about public transportation? What if we worry less about making sure that there's public transportation than we do about making, making that people don't actually have to leave their houses? I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, but people wanna leave their houses. And he's like, no, but just, and then he showed, you know, in Portland, he's like, so this family, you know, she used to be a teacher somewhere, but now she has a nursery school in the back of her house. Oh, like, you know, not leaving the house. I know for some people that it's like a death sentence, right? But for me in the pandemic, like I'm a homebody. I loved it. I mean, it's part of why I have this little business in my, my yard is like people come to me to take classes. I don't have to go anywhere. I love this, right? So what if you could have less of a need for transportation? You know, you can still go places that you want to, but you don't have to drive an hour to go to work in the morning or be on the bus for 40 minutes, you know, or whatever. Like, what if, what if you could do what you needed to do? Your needs were being met just like, you know, in, within walking distance of your house. Huh. Like, so this idea of thrivelihoods, like what if we had career options that were about building careers that made sense for the future, like growing food? you know, 
um, building soil that then grows really good food. You know, like flowers are a luxury, but people pay pretty good money for flowers, you know? Um, medicinal plants, cannabis, right? <laughs> you know, medicinal mushrooms, like there's all kinds of things. I mean, for a long time, this has been sort of illicit and because it's illicit, it's like, you know, makes more money. Um, but there's so many opportunities for exchange of resources and these sorts of interpersonal trades, they build community in ways that we don't really have a lot of things that do that anymore. And I found like my little flower business, it just doesn't make any money, but it builds relationships, right? And that's another yield. And I feel like building relationships is going to be way more lucrative in the long run, especially with uncertainties in terms of, you know, fires and climate and economic challenges than, you know, whatever money I might extract from selling flowers, you know, that there's a lot of other yields that, that can be got. So if we, if we start thinking about like, you know, what are the, what are the real needs that people have? You know, and so like Bill Raleigh um, is a permaculture teacher. He talks about the five fingers of permaculture, like food, waste, water, it's the one that I forgot before, um, energy and shelter. And then, you know, like I would also add in like certainly medicine should be in there, right? Um, probably fibers, you know, fibers and fabrics, another really critical one, um, especially for women throughout history. Um, there's a lot of things that should be on that hand more than just the five, but you know, it, if, if you could pick one of those things that really gets you going, like maybe it's knitting, you know, and then like get into knitting um, and being able to do that. That's a really important skill. Um, you know, how did people catch fish before we had plastic? They knit together plant fibers and made these little fish cages, right? You know, there are so many really cool things that translate into, you know, keeping people fed, watered, clothed, sheltered, et cetera, um, that, you know, we can do it like as a hobby or, you know, for some people it might be, yeah, I'm going to make a career out of this. Um, but I feel like if we start thinking like that and build in some skill sets, you know, through mentorship or taking classes at PCC or other places that are pretty accessible, um, it seems like a really smart way to, to be planning for an uncertain future. And, and I feel like the plants to me are just like the, the, the wise elders just waiting for us to wake up a little bit and like see how things are. That is awesome. I feel like a good place to end also. So That is great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Judith, did you have a question or anything? I guess I'm the audience uh, or the live. Um, I think we both are. But we're also live audience. You know, I want to just, I mean, part of what um, you're very wisely saying is that, that dealing with, with the plant world and the plant ecology is asking us to reimagine community in the 21st century. Um, and it may be reimagining community based on, you know, ancient models or um, non hyper industrialized um digitally dependent models what have you um but it's it's important as i say i'm looking out my back window and like while you were talking about it there's a little monarch going mm -hmm. and um you know i i have planted milkweed in my front yard and tried to keep it going and and watch the 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 monarchs lay eggs and they hide them under the leaves and then the you know aphids show up and then somebody else shows up and then there's a possum that kind you know blah 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 it's i mean it's super interesting um but it's also um it's also important and um this lauren bond project which I, i'd encourage people to find out about and if not visit i mean they have dug up part of the los and the, the so-called river that we <laughs> this concrete channel this hideous concrete channel that's over 100 years old and they, they dug up earth from under that concrete channel and in that earth was were seeds that they've been able to regrow so it's basically the vegetation that was present in the los angeles basin pre um industrial modernity and that's actually really exciting 
you know, in, in, at a number of levels, not just because it's, it's still there and still alive, but but talking about remediating that kind of landscape, um, it's a real possibility. It doesn't mean inventing it and popping in your own new stuff, but actually figuring out what has worked there all along um, and been part of everyone's food ways, humans and animals and uh, and insects. And that is what we need to be thinking about in terms of how we relate. And weirdly, we have this kind of technology that we're communicating through um, that's available to us now. It probably won't be for long. Um, it'll morph into something else hideous, but um, but at least right now, you know, <laughs> we can use it for our own purposes. So, um, so it's totally exciting what you're doing. Yeah. It is wonderful. I'm trying to keep these at an hour. So if you don't mind, I'm going to stop the recording, but I don't, doesn't mean you can't stop asking questions. So if that, if that is cool. All right. Um, 